but uh, but hopefully you've all uh, learned a lot throughout this whole um, last several months and uh, hopefully um, you are continuing to have good experiences and uh, are willing to um, you know continue to learn from others um, we know that the networking opportunities are not the same uh, when we're not doing an in-person um, program but uh, if there is someone that you recognize um, being a part of this that you would like to connect with please just let me know and I'll see what I can do to connect uh, the two of you. And now for just a little bit of housekeeping. If you registered before yesterday, um, you should have received a, an email with um, the Zoom information on it. And uh, included in that email was a link to the SurveyMonkey evaluation. Um, if you could take a few minutes to uh, fill that out, and uh, get it back to us. Um, it helps us in just developing a stronger and more effective um, symposium for the future. Um, if uh, you were a last minute registration, I will send you the link following this presentation. Uh, please make sure your computer is on mute. And if you need um, credit for this course, or for this presentation, please make sure that your name is correct on your video feed. If uh, you're not sure how to do that, just go ahead and um, to the participants area, hover over your name, and uh, you'll see a little blue um, icon that says more. Uh, if you click on that, you should see um, uh, rename and go ahead and just type your name in and it will automatically change it. Um, if you're watching with the group, and again, if you need credit for this in some way, um, please make sure that you email me uh, your group name um, and the individual names that are in your, um, in your viewing group. Um, if you're calling in on the phone, and again, if you need credit, um, when you have a moment, either email or text me your name. Um, you should have all that contact information in the emails that I have sent you uh, previously. Um, if you need a certificate of uh, participation, again, email me and I will send you one. If you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and post them in the chat area. Um, I will be monitoring that. Um, if there's a critical question, I will interrupt our speaker, but um, for the most part, we are going to wait until the end uh, and we'll have uh, plenty of time for Q&A at that point. If um, you do wanna ask a question, please go ahead and turn your camera on and unmute yourself at that time and uh, go ahead and ask your question directly to um, Dr. Adelja. Um, again, thank you for your continuous support at the Intermount Center for Disaster Preparedness. And if we can be of any service to you or your organization, please feel free to reach out. Um, we're here to help. Um, and now without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our speaker today. Dr. Um, uh, uh, Amish Adalja is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and adjunct assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and, is, and an affiliate of the Johns Hopkins Center for Global Health. His work is focused on emerging infectious diseases, pandemic preparedness, and biosecurity. Dr. Adelja has served on US government panels tasked with developing guidelines for the treatment of plague, botulism, and anthrax in mass casualty settings, and for the system of care for infectious disease emergencies. He served as an external advisor to the New York City Health and Hospital Emergency Management Highly Infectious Disease Training Program, and on a US Federal Emergency Management Working Group on Nuclear um, Disaster Recovery. Dr. Adalja is a spokesperson for the Infectious Disease Society of America. He's also a member of the American College of Emergency Physicians, Pennsylvania Chapters, EMS and Terrorism and Disaster Preparedness Committee, as well as the Allegheny County Medical Reserve Corps. Dr. Adalja serves on um, the Primary Care and Chronic Illness Standing Committee and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Service National Disaster Medical uh, systems um, DMAT team, which he uh, was deployed to Haiti after the 2010 earthquake. During the COVID pandemic, Dr. Adelja has served as a member of the National Collegiate 
um, Athletic Association, Coronavirus Advisory Group, and a consultant to various businesses, schools, and organizations, and an informal advisor to the International Monetary Fund. Dr. Dalja is an associate editor of the journal Health Security, and he has authored or contributed to many publications and periodicals, including the New, York, um, the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Journal of Infectious Diseases, and many more. Dr. Dalja is a board certified physician and an internal uh, medicine, emergency medicine, infectious disease, and critical care medicine. Dr. Dalja completed fellowships in infectious disease and critical care medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, a combined residency in internal medicine and emergency medicine at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh, where he also serves as a clinical and an adjunct assistant professor. Um, in addition, he is an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Biology or Biological Science at Carnegie Mellon. Dr. Adalja received an MD from the American University of Caribbean School of Medicine and a BS in Industrial Management from Carnegie Mellon. Dr. Adalja is a native of Butler, uh, Pennsylvania and actively practices infectious disease, critical care and emergency me uh, medicine in the Pittsburgh metropolitan area. Phew. That is quite a lifetime um, of uh, accomplishments. Please um, join me as we welcome Dr. Amish Adalja. I thank you for that introduction. I didn't think you were going to read all of it, um, but uh, it's, uh, it is very <laughs> <Very down. laughs> We didn't lose anybody during that. Uh, uh, during that boring uh, part of my my biography, but thank you again for this invitation to talk. Like like Barb said, uh, my name is Amish Adalja. I'm a, a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, which is a think tank focused on emerging infectious disease, uh, pandemic preparedness, infectious disease emergencies, the intersection of infectious disease and and national security. And I work a lot on all of those subjects, and I've been doing that since I was in training. I also take care of patients and have been taking care of COVID patients since the beginning of this pandemic. And I, I also want to just emphasize that I do do a lot of public speaking and I try to talk to the general public about this and that's become a major uh, theme of this pandemic. But what I wanted to do today, and I think it's important that I'm talking to a, a crowd that's largely comprised of emergency management and disaster medicine people is kind of take a step back and understand how we got to where we were, what's coming next, and and how to think about that. And not enough foresight is really put into thinking about pandemic preparedness. And I think we hey, really got caught off guard during this pandemic based on, on all that most of you probably have seen in this field over time, because I've been part of this field for, for a while. I've been with disaster management people uh, in many different settings. And I do think that we have a, a problem with getting the attention that, that we deserve when it comes to pandemic threat. So, I'm going to kind of talk for maybe 45 minutes or so. I, I'm not, I've not timed it. I don't like to use slides in these types of events because people kind of tune out. So I'm just going to talk and kind of tell you a story about this whole field and where this pandemic came from and what to expect next and, and how to do better the next time. So, so this is kind of going to be that kind of a narrative type of uh, um, talk. So what I wanted to start with first is just trying to ask, you know, why did COVID-19 impact the United States the way it did? If you had looked back and looked at the United States in terms of preparedness, the United States was ranked number one, meaning that it was the most prepared for any type of pandemic that would occur. And we, we did okay during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. And I think that when you look at those indexes, it really has to do with the toolbox we have, the technology, the resources, the money, the expertise, and they don't really, it doesn't really reflect how well you execute that. And that's what happened during this pandemic. So let's rewind all the way back to December 30th or the 31st, 2019, when you were all at some New Year's party. At that time, China was dealing with cases of an unknown respiratory infection that was occurring in clusters, mixed in with their flu, because this was a flu season that was not, wasn't, wasn't a mild flu season back then, it was an ordinary flu season, it was mixed in there. And at that time, there were just rumors that there was something going on that they, they didn't quite know what it was yet, or they were trying to figure it out. And they made a notification to the World Health Organization on New Year's Eve that a novel coronavirus had been reported or found. At that time, certain countries, namely Taiwan, which is kind of the, the hero of the whole COVID-19 story, jumped into action immediately. And it took some time before we realized what was going on in China. Because initially this was thought of as something that was spreading at a seafood market from animals to humans and not really transmitting between humans. 
But soon after we found out that was wrong and you had a virus, a coronavirus that spreads efficiently from person to person. Now at that point, and this is early January, that should have changed the entire approach of the United States because we know that coronaviruses are a family of viruses that cause about 25% of our common colds. And if they can transmit efficiently, unlike some of the other coronaviruses like SARS and MERS, that means the game is over. And when I, when I say the game is over, that means it's not something that can be contained. That means a pandemic is imminent, that, you, that there's no way to keep it out. And you have to realize that since this had been spreading for some time, and remember the first case that China initially reported got ill on December 1st, had no contact with the seafood market. So that tells you with an incubation period of 14 days that this person got infected in November and he got infected in the community, telling you that this was spreading in November in China. And that means that, it's, that the cases that you were seeing were just the tip of the iceberg, that it had likely already left China. And indeed we found that there were cases in France around Christmas, there were cases in Italy uh, around that time as well. So that really should shift your whole approach saying, this isn't something we can keep out with closing borders or really tight screening criteria. What we have to do is get ready. And one of the best ways to get ready is to be able to identify who is infected and who is not. And to me, this is the worst part of the pandemic is that in the United States, we were flying blind and we still are flying blind in many ways when it comes to testing. So if you remember back in January with testing, what they had talked about was a test that was developed by the CDC that ended up being a flawed test. And that flawed test was then distributed to, to state health departments all around the country. And not only was this test cumbersome to use and had a long turnaround time, the testing criteria was so strict that it was almost laughable. You could only test somebody if they had been to China in the last 14 days. And I, as I said, we already knew that this was already outside of China. And you could only test people that had lower respiratory tract symptoms, meaning you could not test somebody that had a sore throat, even though we knew those people were contagious. So what do you get? You get undocumented chains of transmission that bubble up all over the country and put hospitals in places like New York City into crisis, which is no surprise if you can't answer a basic question of who is infected and who is not. And it's not as if we didn't have better solutions at that point. You could have, at that time, so for many of you who work in the hospital, you may know that hospitals can develop their own tests basically on the fly within days because the sequence of a virus gets known and you can make a laboratory developed test. The same is true for big companies like Quest and LabCorp. But paradoxically, when a public health emergency is declared, the, that whole window of laboratory developed tests that Quest, LabCorp, every university lab could develop, that that basically that window closes and they have to go through the emergency use authorization pathway. So we were completely stymied and relying on tests that, that were flawed from the CDC that were hard to give, to, hard to administer for so long while in South Korea, they basically had drive, drive ups in, in winter of 20, in, in January, February, March, they started to develop drive ups where you could get tested immediately. And we couldn't do that. We actually still can't do that now. So, so that, that testing problem, and I think we would have been in a much better position if we would have unleashed the ability of those companies and the, and the universities who had the tests ready uh, until that, uh, to be able to test people and, and not have to go through that emergency use authorization. So we got into a major, major, major mess there. The other issue was hospital capacity. We knew just from the Chinese epidemiology that this was going to impact our hospitals, but we didn't actually tell the hospitals to get prepared. And this is a long-standing problem where hospital preparedness is often an afterthought that big hospital e executives don't really plug into the emergency management divisions of their hospital. They don't have, those, those managers might be in, in the basement somewhere that they do a couple of exercises, usually on mass shootings, but don't really prepare or have the resources to prepare for sustained surges or have the ability to talk to hospital executives and say, this is something that should be really considered part of continuity of operation, something that can't just be an afterthought, not just checking a box to get CMS to, to meet the CMS or Joint Commission uh, accreditation standards. This has to be part of your everyday, everyday work. And for those of you who work in the field, we know that this is something that we've always been emphasizing. We saw it with Superstorm Sandy in New York. We've seen it with Hurricane, obviously with Hurricane Katrina, uh, what happened there. We've seen it during even rough flu seasons that this becomes a major issue, but it's often neglected. And we knew that this was going to impact very hard and we didn't do anything. 
We also saw that this that COVID-19 had a very differential impact, that younger people tend to be spared severe disease, tend to be less likely to be hospitalized, but nursing homes are basically a powder keg. And we all know that nursing homes and their ability to do infection control is severely compromised just from all the MRSA and C. diff and influenza and norovirus that occurs on a day-to-day -day basis. But we really didn't do anything to fortify those nursing homes. In fact, in certain states, they did the opposite. They actually asked states to take uh, infective, uh, contagious patients who had recovered from COVID-19. Uh, that happened in my home state of Pennsylvania. It happened in New York. Uh, very, that, that's been, become a major scandal there. It happened in New Jersey. And, and so I think that th those types of actions just really speak to the fact that even though we have this great toolbox, we just did all the wrong things. Personal protective equipment. Uh, we knew there was going to be a surge on that, but uh, and I think we had thought about this and had a strategic national stockpile where there were N95 masks, for example, but they weren't replenished after the 2009 pandemic, even though we all knew they needed to be replenished. It's it just a lot of mistakes that happened. And then think about contact tracing. Very quickly, most public health agencies got overwhelmed with contact tracing. Why? Because they don't have enough contact tracers, because public health agencies are often undervalued in this country. They are not something that you ever see a mayor or a county executive or even a governor campaigning about. When do they talk about how good their public health department is? How many cases of, of gonorrhea did they prevent or how many cases of congenital syphilis? You don't see it. We live in lug luxury and we don't actually think about what goes on at public health agencies. And it is very hard to be hired by a county government or a city government quickly. So no states actually hired enough contact tracers. And, and, and that was the early part of the pandemic. And this is now talking maybe January to April or May. But the mind boggling thing is that we repeated the exact same thing in the summer and, got, and, and people scratched their heads wondering what the result was. Why, why, are, why is there a surge in cases again? Why are contact tracers overwhelmed? And the obvious question is because you didn't actually invest in the public health infrastructure necessary to deal with it. And then you thought they can't possibly do this again, but they did it again. In November and December, we got hit hard again, the same problems. And, and I think that this really just speaks to the fact that no matter all of our, no matter what assets we have, if we don't have actual proper leadership and a willingness to actually deploy them, you're going to end up in a mess. And the countries like Taiwan did fa fabulously well just by sticking to the core functions of public health without having to rely on very blunt lockdowns by, by testing, tracing, and isolating by meeting cases as they came. And I think we could have done that if we would have jumped into action in January with a proactive approach. And so that's kind of my nutshell over of what happened in this pandemic. And I could talk for five hours on this, but I'm going to move on to the next part of this is, and that's trying to understand what it takes for a pathogen to be able to do this, to cause a pandemic, because not every infectious disease is going to be able to do what COVID-19 did to the United States. So before this pandemic, I, I worked on a project called the Characteristics of Pandemic Pathogens. And if you want to Google that title with my name in it, you'll find it. It's a, it's a big report, which really delves into what it takes for a uh, a pathogen to be able to cause the widespread disruption and death that something like COVID-19 did. So I'm going to kind of walk you through a few things. So we know that not every infectious disease can do this and not every type of pathogen can do this. So what would be most likely to do this? So the first thing to think about is spread. Obviously, it has to be contagious. It has to get from person to person if it's going to be able to cause a pandemic. You're not going to see a pandemic of tetanus or a pandemic of anthrax because they're not contagious. And when you think about how things spread from person to person, there are more and less efficient ways. For example, Ebola is spread through blood and body fluids, and you all probably had to deal with the Ebola response back in 2014. That's not very efficient for a, a pathogen to spread because you've got to have contact with somebody, very close contact to be exposed to their blood and body fluids, and that can be prevented very easily by using gowns and gloves and, and masks and eye protection. So Ebola doesn't usually fit that criteria. Think about another way things can transmit, fecal oral. So we can have major fecal oral trans, uh, transmission events like cholera outbreaks, for example, or hepatitis A, which you've all probably dealt with. But that can be pretty much stopped with just basic sanitation. Indeed, if you look at the, the, rise, of those, the rise and fall of those fecal oral diseases, it usually follows sanitation before you do anything else. So if you can keep people from not defecating where they eat or drink, and keep those things separate in sanitation, those types of things can't really spread and cause a pandemic. 
So that really leaves the respiratory route. And I'm not going to get into the, the nuances between respiratory droplet and airborne here. You can ask me that in the question. But if something can spread through the respiratory route, through coughing, talking, laughing, sneezing, it's very efficient for, for a pathogen. Because those are things you can't just do some simple public health intervention and stop. Indeed, we've tried it with masks, and you saw how, how bad that's failed. Because people don't want to actually do that, and it's very cumbersome and, and not easy to do because it requires people to comply. And not everybody's going to do it all of the time. So when you think about what, ca cause a pan what can cause a pandemic, it's going to be something spread through the respiratory route. And then you got to think, what could it be? A virus, uh, a, bac a bacteria, a fungus, lots of things, prions, parasites. And, and to cut to the chase, it's going to be viruses because we have broad spectrum antibiotics that do a very, a very good job at keeping bacterial diseases from causing pandemics. Of course, they did in the past. If you go back to the Black Death and the Plague of Justinian, all, Plague has been able to do it, but we've got a lot of effective antibiotics. And even with drug-resistant organisms, we can usually craft something together to make it uh, not rise to a pandemic level. Viruses, on the other hand, mutate a lot. They have very fast generation times or replication cycles. And it's very hard to make a, make a broad spectrum antiviral because as we've seen with remdesivir, uh, w as we've seen with other antivirals failing against COVID because viruses don't carry much. They don't have much baggage with them. They don't have much of their own. They use all of your stuff. So in order to make a specific antiviral, it takes time. And it's not gonna be something you can just grab off the shelf and say, we can use this the way we use a, an antibiotic. And, and that makes it very, very difficult to have a, a, a ready to go countermeasure against the virus. And that's why they rise to the top. The other characteristics to remember are contagious during the incubation period. If something is contagious before someone has symptoms, you cannot contain it because it's, it's going to be out there before you even know that it exists. If people can go about their activities of daily living and be infectious to other people, that's not going to be containable. Uh, so, so that is an, another characteristic to remember. So you've got a whole, a whole host of these types of characteristics that you can put together. And that tells you that respiratory viruses that spread during their incubation period are likely to be the next pandemic pathogen. So where does that all put, put you and how does that fit with certain viruses that we know about? Obviously, SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID-19, meets all that criteria. Uh, we didn't initially know that it was contagious during the incubation period, but we soon found that out. But there are other viruses that do that as well. Influenza, which I think is the greatest pandemic threat that we face, and influenza has caused pandemics in 1918 and 57 and 68 and 2009. We had a mini pandemic in 77. Uh, all of that really maps onto influenza. So I wanted to talk about what a new approach would mean. And a new approach would be to take those characteristics and actually make a program, a pandemic preparedness program, in a proactive fashion saying, let's map those types of characteristics on the known viral families that are out there. And it really falls to about five viral families that have this ability. Some of them you've heard of, like coronaviruses, obviously, and influenza viruses. But there are others, too, uh, para-influenza the, the, There's different families, which I won't get into the technical details, but they're, they're all respiratory viruses that you might have heard about, like adenoviruses, rhinoviruses, paramyxoviruses, uh, which include things like paraflu, RSV, Hendra, Nipah. And, and all of those viral families have members in them that cause ordinary illnesses, like RSV, or adenovirus causes sore throats. And within that group of families, you often will find candidate vi you have viruses that could have pandemic potential. And I think that a new approach, and this is something we're trying to, to really advocate for at the Center for Health Security, would to be very, be very proactive about these types of viral families and start research programs, not just on the scary ones, not just on Nipah virus, but on kind of the puny ones like para-influenza, because the more you learn about these viruses, the more antivirals you develop, the more vaccines you develop, the more monoclonal antibodies you develop, the more likely one of those is going to be of use when one of the bad ones actually appears. And if you look at what happened with our COVID-19 vaccines, one of the reasons that we were able to develop a candidate vaccine in hours, BioNTech, which par partnered with Pfizer, had a vaccine candidate in hours, was because so much work had been done with the first SARS and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. They had already identified the spike protein as being very important for protect protection against infection and protection against severe disease. So uh, automatically they knew 
if we can, we need to work on the spike, we need to work on vaccines against spike protein for SARS-CoV-2. So that, that saved us. Imagine if you did that for all of the pandemic threats that are out there, and there's not that many uh, based on the characteristics, you would have a, a huge jump start in order to do it. Of course, there's gonna be difficulties and flu is one that has multiple difficulties because of its mutation rate, but it is something that you would see really increase the resilience, but it would take a proactive approach, one that's not waiting, not reactive. So what happens in our pandemic world is that unless it's, unless it's flu, it really doesn't get funded and it doesn't get prepared for. It's, everything is reactive. So if you think about Zika, which wasn't a pandemic, but it was a major public health emergency, we couldn't do anything with Zika because there was no specific appropriation because no one had thought about it. No one had put it on any list. And I think we have to move away from that list-based approach and just be proactive about infectious disease threats from whatever viral family they, they arise from, because we can't be waiting for senators and congressmen to, to put in an official bill saying this is for Zika, but you, can, and, and, and not, you can't use your influenza funds on Zika, that type of siloing that occurs and that they want things to be directly tied to a specific pathogen. This is for anthrax, this is for botulism, this is for plague. That's not going to work and, it's, and it made us less resilient. So I do think that this proactive approach is something that has to be identified as a way to do it. And we're seeing the NIH do this. We're seeing government agencies start to really think about viral family approaches, which wasn't something people thought about even five, six years ago. When I started floating this idea, I got a lot of resistance, but I think now we're seeing it. And, and it's also codified in that disease X approach that you might see the World Health Organization talk about being prepared for anything that comes out there by really being advanced. And, and you can do that not just by working, we can do that with by working on viral families, but we also have another tool, platform vaccines, where you can obviously uh, come up with ways to plug and play, basically. If you know, if, you, if you've got some platform that you can reuse, like a space shuttle, uh, to use an analogy, and just change the payload uh, on it, which is what you can do with some of the vaccines, including the mRNA vaccines, including uh, the way the J&J &J and AstraZeneca vaccines work. Uh, that that's going to be very, very easy to make a candidate virus vaccine quickly and get it into clinical trials quickly. And that may hopefully change the face of how we deal with these infectious disease emergencies with getting a vaccine much, much quicker than you would anticipate. The other thing I think we, we need to focus on is testing. And I, I, I alluded to it earlier, but I want to just delve into it a little bit more. Before COVID-19, we really had a kind of a fragmented way that we test for infectious disease. So, so think about any time you might have had pneumonia. You went to the hospital, you got diagnosed with pneumonia, or maybe your grandparent did, and they said, you've got a pneumonia, we're gonna give you some antibiotics. We did a chest X-ray, we did some basic blood tests and maybe a blood culture or urine test to look for certain pathogens, and then you get better or you don't. This non-specific di diagnosis saying you've got pneumonia or you've got sepsis, we didn't find anything, so you, you got better or you didn't get better. That's just, we're just gonna leave it at that. That type of paradigm can't stand. If you're an oncologist, you would never tell a patient, you've got some type of cancer, we're gonna throw some type of chemotherapy at you. It's gonna work or it's not gonna work. But yet that's what we do with infectious disease all the time. We leave so many things undiagnosed and lurking in that, what I call biological dark matter are gonna be important pathogens, some that might have the ability to cause a pandemic, some that might be, this might be the first or second time it's getting into a person, or it might be a change in something that we know about. So we've got to start doing more specific diagnosis. And I think COVID-19 showed people because lots of people with COVID-19 had negative flu tests and people just said, we've got some other virus and they went on and spread it all around. Indeed, some of the cruise, cruise lines were testing for flu only. And when they were flu negative, they said, it's fine. You don't have flu, go about your day because you didn't come from China. Uh, that type of approach is disastrous. And I think a lot of hospitals saw the value finally in buying respiratory viral panels or getting much more aggressive with diagnostic testing. And that has to be something we, that we want to push for in an infectious disease that we don't have these nonspecific diagnosis of meningitis or encephalitis or sepsis or pneumonia that we really push to get a diagnosis. And it will improve care. It will improve antibiotic stewardship. It'll be less unnecessary antibiotics. And we'll get a lot of good data epidemiologically and get much better and more resilient at pandemics because we're in a practice of trying to identify what viruses are out there causing infections in people. The other aspect of this is home tests. And today, the Biden administration announced $1 billion uh, more for home tests to make them increasingly available to the American public. And this is 
all great news, but we needed this back in February and March. The technology was ready for home tests uh, back in 2020. It just was not something that they wanted to do. In fact, prior to COVID-19, the only home test where you could get results in your home for an infectious disease in the United States was for HIV. And that took the company, or Ashore, about 10 years to get through the FDA. And I think this has to be something that also changes, that we start to be able to test not just for COVID-19, but for influenza or group A strep or whatever it might be at home. And there had been investments in home flu tests. I sort of imagine like uh, when I was little, I used to watch the, George, the, the Jetsons and they had all these great technologies. And one, and, and one of the technologies I, they didn't have on the show, but what, which I think is kind of Jetson-like is that you have like a, a device at your house in your, in your kitchen or maybe in your bathroom where you've got cartridges in it and you can swab your nose and you stick it in there and it tells you you've got adenovirus or you've got flu or you've got COVID or you've got, you have strep throat or you have mono. That's all easily available now. And imagine how easy it would be to do that because then that would save you a trip to the urgent care and you might end up not getting inappropriate antibiotics that the urgent care doctor is going to give you for a virus. It gives the public, public health agencies data about what viruses are circulating. It, it, it links you to antivirals. So, so for example, with influenza, you might get a Tamiflu prescription. It, it helps you with children. They don't go to school because they've got a viral infection that keeps them out of, out of school. So they don't have the spread at schools. And imagine if you are in a town or in a city or you've got some super users of this machine and a bunch of them are sick and they all they test with their cartridge, their panel, and then maybe has 10 or 15 things to test for. And it's all negative, but they're all sick. And it's coming up negative like that in multiple parts in multiple people in a given town or a given state or in a country. Wouldn't that be really useful data for people to know? Well, these people are all using the machine. And they're all coming up negative, but they're sick. There's something there. We need to go in there and investigate. We need to use a more sophisticated test. That would be an early warning system that could be deployed so easily. If you look, for example, at the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, the reason that we got a head start or we knew about it in April of 2009 was because two little girls were part of a study where if they had a flu virus that couldn't be figured out, it would get sent on to a lab. And that's how we figured out that there was a novel strain of H1N1 circulating in Mexico, in the United States, because of those two little girls getting that, that test because they were part of it, they went to a lab or went to an urgent care center that was part of a research study. And we also know during COVID-19, when, when they were getting hit hard, you, some of those people, some people have bought what are called smart thermometers that kind of network so you can see how many people are taking their temperature in a given town. A lot of people were taking their temperature in places before COVID-19 cases hit because they were getting sick and they were taking their temperature. That's valuable data that would make us so much more resilient to pandemic threats and even infectious disease outbreaks and emergencies uh, if people were, um, were using these types of things. And it's not a technological barrier now. Now it's a political, it's just a political and regulatory barrier. So hopefully this is something that changes because we can't really let this type of paradigm stand where we're reactive, flat-footed, where we do things the old way and not use 21st century tools to combat these, these pathogens. And I think that the, the, the other point to, to remember is that we also have to take politics out of this. I'm an infectious disease doctor. I have never been in the midst of political fights like I have been during COVID-19 where I'm getting threats on a daily basis. Uh, uh, getting, it's, a, it's a man body or a woman. Yeah. Um, it's a man's body, but it's half. There's nothing up here. <laughs> getting death threats on a daily basis, getting email threats, getting threats from the mail. Um, and and I, made a, I talked about the fact that I do a lot of public speaking. And one of the things I do is I go on television a lot. And I made a conscious decision early on in the pandemic to go on all three of the major cable networks in the United States, to go on Fox, to go on MSNBC, to go on CNN, because I wanted to be seen as someone who was telling it as they believe it to be, not as they want an audience to hear or with any kind of political slant. But obviously that doesn't work. And I get hate mail from the left and from the right on a daily basis because I don't necessarily fall into one category because science doesn't fall into one category. And I think our politicians have failed us that when you look at what happened in COVID-19, this isn't a failure of medicine. It's not a failure of science or failure of hospitals. It's a failure of government. Government at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, at the school district level, at the county level, at the city level, at the municipal level, that's where this failure occurred. And we have to start advocating for 
pandemic preparedness, disaster preparedness to be something that is considered a core function of government, something that they're going to do right, that's going to be removed from politics. You can't have the CDC bound and gagged and thrown in the trunk, uh, basically, is what's happened during this pandemic, and then expect them to be able to function or expect the general public to be able to trust them. The politicians got way ahead of this pandemic. It occurred during the prior administration. It's occurring even today in this administration. This is something that we have to fix and, and make this considered more like the Department of Defense, where they don't have politics imbued in it. And we actually do what's right because it's right, not because it's based on polling numbers or not because we're trying to negotiate a trade deal or whatever it might be. So I do think that we have to, as we have elections coming up, I think we should talk to our politicians that this is, what is your plan for pandemics? What is your plan for, for uh, how we become more resilient? And it can't be an afterthought. They need to be, this needs to be something that we judge judge uh, politicians on, that, that this has to be something that's part of their platform. And it's something that we consider uh, uh, an important aspect of what a politician should be able to do. Because this pandemic, I think, touched everyone's life, lives. It disrupted everyone's lives. It took over 700,000 Americans' lives, many of which were preventable deaths. So I think that we can never let this happen again. And I think that the way to do that is to make sure that we put in place the programs and the systems to allow it to, to, to not allow it to ever happen again. And I think that we can do that with our votes. We can do that by meeting with Congress people, meeting even with state legislators, meeting with mayors, meeting with city councils, uh, just trying to get people to think about how important this is because so much of this could have been prevented and done better because we had been predicting, and I'm sure you were too, being in this field, uh, basically talking to ourselves for two decades about what would happen during a pandemic. And lots of our reports probably gathered dust and desk drawers, even though they had all the right answers there, because we didn't have the people that actually wanted to read them. And I think that's what we've got to, got to change. So I'm going to end shortly. I just want to give a, a, a just the last thing I wanted to talk about was what I think is next, what's on the horizon. I talked about earlier certain viruses that have characteristics that could cause pandemics. And to me, flu is always going to be the highest. There are some very uh, scary flu viruses that are circulating in China. Uh, particularly H7N9, uh, which is an avian flu virus, which has a very high mortality rate, uh, 30%. It has not been able to transmit efficiently from human to humans. If you ask me what is the greatest pandemic threat or the scariest one we face right now, it is H7N9, uh, avian influenza. So, so that's something to keep a lookout on. There are other uh, swine flu viruses, one called G4, that I would think um, is, is high on the list as well. Um, again, not, not, that doesn't have the ability to sustain transmission between humans, but ones that bear watching. There are also viruses like Nipah virus, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a, a virus that comes from the paramyxovirus family. It comes from bats, and many viruses come from bats. Um, but the paramyxovi th this, uh, this paramyxovirus, Nipah virus, has caused outbreaks in Malaysia, Bangladesh, and India. It, it causes encephalitis or inflammation of the brain. In some outbreaks, it's transmitted efficiently from person to person. In others, it is not, but it is one to keep on the radar. Uh, we also have to keep lookout for any coronaviruses because there are so many coronaviruses in bats uh, that also have that potential. And I think the important thing is to keep an active mind, to, to really look at those threats and, and take them seriously because we live on a planet that teems with microorganisms. I tell people, if you were an alien looking at Earth, you would say that's a, that's a planet of, of viruses, bacteria, parasites, worms, and some other species. So just remember that pandemic threats are not going to go away. They're only going to increase as we do more things, as we travel more widely, as we travel quicker from place to place. So this is something that we need to do as a, as a species in order to make ourselves more resilient. So I think that this is a uh, this is an opportunity for all of us in this field to really make our voices heard. And, and I think people are listening now. So there is an opportunity and that opportunity exists not just at the federal level, but at the local and state level as well. So I urge you to do that. So I'm, this, this ends kind of my prepared talks. I'm happy to take questions. I hope that was useful and interesting uh, for you. So thanks again for the invitation to speak. Oh, thank you. That was fabulous. Um, I apologize to those of you who got in late. Um, I am going to be sending out a link to this talk so you can watch it later. But um, for now, does anyone have any questions? And please feel free to unmute and turn on your camera and ask directly. Don't be shy. You can also put it in the chat if you'd prefer, and I can read it for you. Okay. 
Okay, well, I have one we can start with. Um, where, and I might have missed it, where are you seeing um, this H7N9 um, virus right now? So H7N9 circulates in China in, in really around poultry farms. It's not something that's in the general public or anything like that yet, but there have been the thousands of cases that have occurred over the last several years. And when you look at the CDC's ranking of flu viruses, it falls at the highest level. Uh, so it's something to keep on your radar. It's something that we should be that we are preparing for with pre-made vaccines and really tracking its ability to, to infect uh, humans and looking at the mutations that it's accruing. So this is something that's on the radar. But with flu, everything has to be something you have to always be prepared because flu can always surprise you because it can jump from, from birds to pigs to humans or pigs to humans or some, some combination or birds directly to humans at any time. Flu is always, it's so well adapted to do that, that because of the way it mutates that we always have to be looking out for, for all these flu viruses. And we have a pretty robust surveillance system for flu, but I suspect that flu will always be able to surprise us uh, just based on its biological characteristics. And people, flu is surprising people like Hippocrates, uh, you know, thousands of years ago. Before they even had all the science to know exactly what they were dealing with, huh? Um, there is a question in the chat. How close are we to home tests? So home tests are available right now in the United States. They're just hard to find. I, tell, I grew up in the 1980s, so it's like trying to find a cabbage patch doll. It's very, very difficult. You have to drive from store to store to store um, to find one, but they, they are available, but they're expensive. They're about $25 for two tests, which is not, not is cost prohibitive for a lot of people. Most, they're in very scarce quantities. So you most, if you go to CVS or Rite Aid, they might say you can buy one pack at a time or they, they sell out really quickly. So we do have home tests, not as many as in Europe. Our, our home tests are pretty onerous to get approved. We're pretty onerous to get approved. The, the FDA basically made them go be, be looked at as like full medical devices instead of really public health tests because a home test, the best use for a home test is asking the question, am I contagious to others? So for an asymptomatic person, you're not sick. So you're not asking the test, what am I sick with? You're asking the test, am I a, a risk to others? And the home tests work really, really well for that. And they don't have to be very sophisticated. They don't have to be very fancy. Uh, maybe for those of you who work with injection drug users, we have fentanyl test strips that we give injection drug users to test their heroin to say, is there fentanyl in it? So they know not to use that or to be more careful when they're using it. We need to think of it like that, harm reduction. And we need tests like that, that are really cheap, that are dollars, that are available everywhere. And I think we're getting towards that, but it's, it's happening very late. Uh, I think that the, the Biden administration is making strides in this effort, but we needed this early on in the pandemic. Imagine if you could have tested yourself in the summer of 2020, or you could have avoided some of those surges if you could have been able to say, I'm positive today, I'm not gonna go to this party, or I'm not gonna visit with so-and-so. But I think it's going to get there. Um, it's just been slow, slow going. And there was a lot of reticence early on in the pandemic to do aggressive testing because some people were kind of taking a scoreboard approach saying, you know, we test too much, we have too many cases and we look bad. And that, that all approach needed to be completely discarded. And I think now it has finally been discarded. So I think we'll get there, but it's late. The impact is not gonna be as good as it could have been. I think that's a great way to look at things. You know, it's not just about me, it's how I'm affecting everyone else. Could you tell us again what that article was about pandemic pathogens? I missed part of that. So I wrote a report called The Characteristics of Pandemic Pathogens. If you just Google that, um, you can find that. Maybe I can, while I'm on here with you, I can, I can put it in the chat. Oh, that'd be great. If, I didn't. if you can find it, great. Um, oh, here's, here's a chat question. Um, how do you prepare for pandemics without making people feel afraid? That's, that's hard to do. I mean, I think that you know, I think what you have to talk to people about is the fact that there are that there are threats out there that the the reason the more prepared you are, the less reason you have to be afraid because you actually know you've got things on the shelf, you've got things that are going to work. I, I would be more afraid if we're not preparing. If people aren't thinking about pandemics, that's actually a scary prospect. So I think what you do is explain to people: yes, we they are our, our, the human species has lived through countless pandemics and infectious disease threats. The Black Death killed one third of Europe's population. Uh, we, we've dealt with this before, and now we've got all these tools, but we just need to use them. So I think it's about not not about 
not about um, scaring them, but more about demystifying pandemics, to explain to them what these things are and how they occur, why they occur, and what types of measures you could you put into place. And the more these measures you put into place ahead of time, the more resiliency you build into your system, the less a threat pandemics become. So that should make you more reassured. If you lived in Taiwan, you're probably pretty reassured right now about pandemics. Uh, and I think if you live in the United States, you're not very reassured uh, based on how we, how we perform. So I think it's about, about giving people the tools to understand pandemics and to advocate for that type of response. And I think you have to teach people how to risk calculate. And we didn't do it very well during this pandemic. It all became kind of abstinence only type of messages. Don't do this ever. And, and people did it anyway. And they did it less safely than they would have done it if you would have told them, why don't you just do this outside? Or why don't you take a test beforehand? Or why don't you wear a mask? Or, or, or those types of things. So I think you can give people toolkits and teach them how to risk calculate to navigate a world that has infectious disease threats in it. That's a much better way to do it. I mean, think about when you go travel when you're going to Africa or something, and they tell, tell you you've got this malaria there, you've got to take malaria pills. You've got to use that type of an approach, I think, with people, and I think it works. Thank you. Um, what is your opinion on masks? So I do think that masks are an important tool. I think they're inferior to vaccines. Vaccines are the best tool to prevent COVID-19 spread. But masks are a, a tool that can decrease transmission. And we all have always said, in the very beginning of the pandemic, we said, if you've got symptoms, you, you shouldn't be around other people. And if you absolutely have to be around other people, wear a mask. What we didn't know at the beginning of the pandemic was that COVID-19 unlike other coronavirus issues that we've had, can spread during its incubation period. That's, that was one of the characteristics I mentioned earlier. Once, so if, if we thought that we could identify everybody that was sick because they had symptoms and tell them stay away from people, that would be enough. But if a virus can spread during its incubation period, there are gonna be people out there that are contagious who don't know they're contagious. And that data wasn't there at the beginning of the pandemic, but it started to trickle out of China. And that's why the mask recommendation changed that masks could serve as a, a way to form a barrier between you and another person. They, they function as source control. And they also protect the wearer, because if you get infected, the mask is likely going to block some of the inoculum. You're going to get less virus, so you may not get as severe of an illness. And that data wasn't there uh, with COVID-19 the, at the beginning of the pandemic. And it emerged over time that places where there was high mask use saw major declines in cases in, in certain areas when people were actually complying with it. And that really influence mask policy. And it's not that there's gonna be randomized controlled trials on masks. It's more like observational studies of places that did masks and did other things versus places that did other things but didn't do masks. And I think you, got, you have to think of masks as a layered strategy approach and something that has a lot of value for unvaccinated individuals. I think when it comes to vaccinated individuals, masks have a very marginal value because it's unlikely that a, a fully vaccinated person is gonna transmit. And when they do transmit, if they are contagious, it's for a very truncated period of time. So the, the bulk of transmission that's occurring in the United States is from unvaccinated to unvaccinated. So I think that they do have a role. Not all masks are equal. Obviously someone wearing a flapping bandana is not really getting much benefit from that. But I do think the hospital type surgical and procedure masks and some of the cloth masks do work. And just a couple of days ago at the Center for Health Security, we just released a report, which I'm a co-author of, on new technologies and innovations that are needed in masks, because they are a blunt tool that can be effective for other respiratory infections as well. And I think we want to make them easier for people to use. We want to make them more comfortable. We want to make them more efficient at filtering stuff out. We want, and I think we can get better at masks, but I do think that they, were, they are an effective tool, but a tool that took some time to actually recognize the value of. And I think that tool still exists for unvaccinated populations primarily. Great, thank you. Um, what did Taiwan do well that we can learn from? And the biggest thing they did was they were proactive. Uh, Taiwan, so I was, I was part of a team that went to Taiwan in 2013 to evaluate their public health preparedness because they're not allowed to be part of the WHO because the Chinese government has not allowed them to be basically. So we went there to look at them 10 years after SARS and they aggressively take pandemic preparedness uh, to the highest level. They, they have so many um, systems in place in a well-funded public health infrastructure that they, they find lots of things that you wouldn't expect them to find. They find dengue cases in the airport, for example, 
they're, they're really good. But what I would say is the best part of, part of their approach was they were proactive. They didn't wait for the, a, a pandemic to be declared or the World Health Organization to declare a pandemic, uh, a public health emergency of international concern. They jumped into action on December 31st and started testing, started screening, started making sure that their hospitals were ready, making sure they had enough personal protective equipment. And they were able to do that without any lockdowns without and, and not doing anything like the New Zealand approach. Their approach was textbook test, trace, isolate, meet cases as they come. And they had, a, a, at a time when the United States had hundreds of thousands of deaths, Taiwan had eight. And, and I think it was really to the fact that they, they, they have a system in place that this is something that's highly prioritized. For example, their vice president has a PhD in epidemiology. And our vice president obviously didn't and doesn't. Um, it would be very hard, it would be hard to imagine a PhD epidemiologist being a politician in the United States, um, especially now, uh, but, but even th that's, that's what they had in place, uh, an epidemiologist. So I think that they, they really understood the value of this. And I think because they're always threatened by China, they're worried about biological warfare, they're worried about avian influenza coming from China, that they're always on alert and they don't think about this as something that they kind of do when, it, when it's in the headlines. So in the United States, we have, you have the, we have the anthrax attacks, things are in the headlines, stuff gets funded, it goes away, funding goes back down. H1N1 in the headlines, Zika, MERS, SARS, all that stuff gets in the headlines and it's boom bust, boom bust, non-sustainable cycles. That doesn't happen in Taiwan. It is sustainably funded and sustainably thought of as a priority. How do we balance mandates and education? Mandates may be fast, but they cause a lot of backlash, especially when used over extended periods. Well, so I think that this is a difficult question, but I would say from with, if you're a private business, if you're a school, I think you want your place to be resilient to COVID-19. You want it to not be disrupted by COVID-19. Just like you don't, if you're a school, you don't want your school to be, be inundated with chickenpox cases or measles cases. So I think that you, that schools have, a, in my opinion, schools have a right to, to decide what their entry criteria can be. And I think that vaccination of the staff, of the, uh, of the, uh, teachers and of the students can be something that is an effective tool. We know that it will keep COVID-19 out of the schools. It's just that this is, you know, we, we haven't seen this kind of acrimony over vaccines for a long time, and I don't know how to solve it. But I do think that private businesses and schools and governments for their own employees, for example, uh, the way the federal government has done it with the federal workforce, those are gonna be ways to, to nudge people to get vaccination. And I think that if you're a company if you're an employer, you want your workforce to be resilient. You want your workplace to be safe. It shouldn't take the government doing it. Unfortunately, we're seeing that happen because so many people are worried about uh, about standing up to unions or uh, worried about workers leaving. That that they're they're scared to do this. But and it's the right the business. It's a right. It's the right business decision. Is, is, and I do a lot of consulting to companies, and many companies like United Airlines, for example, did it on their own before before anybody asked them to, because they had a pilot die, they saw what happens. And I think that, that, that we're, we're in this situation now, we're, we're on this two track pandemic and, and it is the unvaccinated that are, are really holding things back when it comes to hospital capacity. And, and I do think that getting a high, highest level of vaccination possible combined with natural immunity that's occurring, I won't discount natural immunity like some people, some people do, natural immunity does make a difference. That's the way we get this pandemic behind us. And I do think that companies should be really thinking about protecting their workforce and protecting their customers and making their workplace safer by, by using uh, vaccine requirements as a condition of employment. And I think schools should also think about that as well, especially in places where there's high community spread, where there is low levels of vaccination. We know from hospital settings that when hospitals started to require flu vaccines as a condition of employment, the flu vaccine rate went up significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that this vaccine has so much controversy, unnecessarily controversy, unnecessary controversy, unfounded controversy, that it's become a major, major political fight right now. This goes back to another question uh, earlier, but um, while you're talking about symptoms, uh, if a person tests positive for COVID during a weekly work test, but has no symptoms, do they need to quarantine? Self-quarantine. Wait, sorry, can you repeat the question? For just, I just wanna make sure I, got, I heard it correctly. Right. Um, if a person tests positive for COVID during a weekly work test, but they have no symptoms, do they need to self-quarantine? 
So yes, they do. But what I would say is if it was a test and you have no symptoms, you might want to confirm it with another test to make sure it wasn't a false positive. There have been some false positives out there. And when you're doing testing like that, they're going to be false positives. So what I would do is say quarantine and get another test, maybe a more definitive test. If, if it was an antigen test, maybe get a PCR test uh, to see if it actually was a true positive. Again, and companies, this is another issue, is companies need to stop testing fully vaccinated people with no symptoms. They don't want COVID in their, in their, in their workplaces, but we shouldn't be testing asymptomatic individuals um, that are fully vaccinated. The CDC doesn't recommend it, but lots of companies, lots of organizations are continuing to do it. And I think we've got to find an off ramp here because a breakthrough infection in a fully vaccinated individual is unlikely to be very contagious and it is extremely unlikely to be severe. And I don't think we want to be chasing mild illnesses uh, around the, around the country with the, with testing of a, of asymptomatic vaccinated people. Remember, the virus is not going to be eradicated. It's not going to be eliminated. We've got to find a way to to live with this. And our goal has been to tame it, to make it more like other respiratory viruses through the vaccination of high risk individuals that impinge on hospital capacity. So I, I think a lot of this worry over breakthrough infections is misplaced and not really a sustainable approach because there's got to be an off ramp because we're going to have COVID cases 20 years from now. And I think we've got to come up with a better way of doing it. And I think obviously if a, if a vaccinated person is symptomatic, they should be tested. Or if a vaccinated person has a heavy, heavy exposure, um, a real significant exposure, the CDC recommends that they be tested. But I think just this routine screening of the New York Yankees or whatever was going that, that happened for a while, that doesn't make that doesn't make sense scientifically. It's not supported by the CDC guidance and it puts people in weird, um, it puts you in a position where you're chasing these mild illnesses that are not going to really be that clinically significant. Great, thank you. Uh, in Japan, it is considered a sick person's responsibility to wear a mask in public or at work. Everyone I've worked with in the US, people have colds, flu, they come to work, they spread the illness. How do we get our people to not do that and uh, wear masks? I think you have to, you, this has to be a culture change that it shouldn't be normal. First of all, it shouldn't be normal that you come to work when you're coughing and sneezing. That should just be, you shouldn't be there because you're gonna be less efficient. And the fact is now we've got Zoom, we've got all these technologies. There's no, there is no reason for that to be occurring. And my profession, medicine is one of the worst offenders where it's, it's looked as a badge of honor when you're the doctor walking around with your own IV pole as you vomit between, between patients. That, that has to go away. We've got to say that that's not acceptable to expose other people to an infection, even if it's mild at a workplace when it could be completely prevented. And if you have to be there, you should be wearing a mask if you're coughing or sneezing or doing anything that could be contagious to other people. I think we've, we've kind of had a bad hygiene uh, practice ingrained in the workplace. And I think it doesn't make any sense. And hopefully COVID-19 will get people to do that because I think I think it will increase resiliency of workplaces, less absenteeism, make workplaces safer, and I think we have to we have to realize that you don't have the right to go infect other people. So if you're sick, stay home. Or if you have to be around people, uh, wear wear a mask because it's it's not it doesn't do anybody any good, and you're not really a good worker. I know lots of workers want to go home and um, want want to go. They like to um, be sent home rather than stay home and call in sick. But I think that whole paradigm has to shift, especially in the healthcare industry. How does the lack of universal health care in America inhibit future response to the next pandemic? Well, I, I don't know that. So this is a, a complicated question. I don't know that that's obviously the solution because countries that had universal health care also did not do well. And I think it has less to do with universal health care and more to do with actual pandemic preparedness, resilient and, and, and those types of operations. It's because if you look at countries like England or, or look at countries like China or look at uh, look at many other countries that have universal health care, they didn't fare uh, fair, uh, obviously any, any better, I don't think in general. I mean, obviously the US, the US's death rate is high, but not because we don't have universal health care. It's because we made a lot of mistakes. It wasn't from lack of access that people were, I mean, th there was some lack of access that occurs in certain, um, in certain populations. But I think when you look at it as a nationally, I don't see that th that, that was what held the United States back. I think these were political failures things like that, that universal health care would not have fixed if we would have. And, and remember, in the United States, over 50 percent of health care is provided by the government. So we have kind of the, a, a mongrel mix where 50, 51 percent or 52 percent of our health care is is government funded. If you take Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, uh, TRICARE for the military, that, that really amounts to having a majority universal health care. So I don't think that that was the answer here. The answer really is the fact that we have really bad 
politicians that did not follow the science and did not allow public health leaders to take what actions were necessary. Because if you look at other, other infectious disease mortality in the United States, sepsis, for example, it's the lowest in the world. Uh, it's, I, it's, I think that, so I don't think that that's the answer, even though some people look for convenient answers uh, because, because of our system, but I don't think that that, that explains uh, much of why we failed. I think we've got much better explanations for why, why we failed. So Medical News Today reported the effectiveness of nasal flushing and gargling. What is your opinion on this? Well, I think that nasal flushing and gargling might be a general hygiene that helps with a lot of respiratory viruses. I don't think it's specific to COVID-19. Um, I, I would say that I would not think of it as a sub. What we wor I worry about with these types of things is people do that every day and say, "Well, I'm not going to get a vaccine because I nasal flush and gargle every day." That's not the same thing. Nasal flush and gargling may help decrease respiratory infections, but it's not something that I would use as a substitute for a vaccine. It would be something I would do in addition to a vaccine. Okay. I'm going to try to paraphrase this one, David. Um, one of the lessons about warnings and communication from emergency management research is that messages must be clear, concise, and credible. Um, in the case of COVID, they seem to not follow any of that. Um, there was constant mixed messages about masking, about breakthroughs. Um, with all of that in mind, do you have any recommendations for scientists or politicians so we can avoid this in the future? Great presentation. My recommendation for politicians is to not talk, to let the emergency managers, let the let the public health experts, let the physicians talk. Not not having a polit not having politicians talk because they get they they're not skilled at that. And uh, I, I think that the public health communication problem during COVID nineteen in the United States is one of the biggest problems that we've had, and it continues to this day with politicians getting ahead of the science or or saying things before it's actually been vetted or confusing people. But yes, it, it's, you know, we always talked about in emergency management, you know, duck and cover, that type of thing works or, you know, stop, drop and roll. We, we should have thought about things like that with COVID, like do it outside, wear a mask, Th those types of things work. And obviously it's difficult when you're dealing with a novel virus that no one has seen that there's gonna be nuance. And I think we have to explain that better to the public say, and, and I think you guys do this really well, the emergency managers. When you watch a mass casualty and you watch an emergency manager talk, they say, this is what we know now. This is the questions we don't know. This is the certainty we have. We're going to update you at this time with new information. I think we, we should have done that. And I think a lot of doctors get, can, get, can get very definitive um, and use nuance or use medical terms that may have meaning to the medical community, but not to the general public. So then it looks like they flip-flop when really, if you listen, they didn't flip-flop. They said, they, they actually caveated a lot, but it wasn't clear to people. And then they then people end up distrusting. But I do think we've got to get much better on clear messages to, to people. And I think that we can learn a lot from the way emergency management managers work because you guys are trying to do things in the middle of a crisis uh, and you need people to take the correct action to save their lives. And I think that that type of an approach works. But the number one thing is to get the politicians out of it, even though they love the cameras. All right, um, this comes from a PHEP person. What is the off-ramp and way forward in terms of contract tracing, et cetera? Is there a specific trigger point or place where we decide to conclude that? Some people say 10 cases per 100,000. I say when you don't see hospital capacity being threatened, when hospitalizations fall, where it's not something that's super dangerous uh, anymore, that's when I think you can fall, they can fall off. I think it's going to be a slow transition. It's just going to sort of fade away where people then just stop contact tracing. Unless it's a massive mass gathering, maybe you might do contact tracing if there was an outbreak in a nursing home or an outbreak at a, at a concert or something like that where there could be big implications. But eventually, I think when you get our cases down to maybe 10,000 or less per, per, per day in the United States, it's gonna become less valuable because you're gonna be running into people who are vaccinated or immune and it's not gonna have that much um, impact. I also think that we should also tell, tell the public, if you test positive, tell your partners, or like uh, using an HIV thing. If you test positive for HIV, tell your partners. If you test positive for an STD, tell your partners. So we also should be telling people, tell people that you are around, that you, you, are, you they might've been exposed to COVID because you tested positive. And people with home tests, people that are vaccinated, can, can make their own decisions. But I think it's gonna to come to a point where we, we stop when we don't see hospitals in crisis. And there's still a lot of people hospitalized in the United States. I think when we get to the point where 
sadly, the people that are vulnerable for hospitalization are either dead, they're immune, or they're vaccinated, then I think we're going to be in a different position. It's just taking some time for people to think about off ramps. So, so for example, Yale University has like a 99% vaccination rate, and they have all their mitigation still in place. They had it all in place. And people are saying, what's the off ramp there? Um, so you've got, we, I think we do have to start thinking about that off ramp. And some organizations are going to have to think about it because it's not sustainable what they're doing. And I do think the contact tracing will fall away uh, eventually as we get more home tests, as we get cases down. But it's, it's not going to be one size fits all. It's probably going to be different states doing different things as we've seen through this pandemic. And then the last question I see here is, what roles do you think media should play during pandemics? And how well do you think they've been doing this time? Well, media, you have to remember that their motivation is is, is clickbait and to get people to watch. So they will often blow things up out of proportion that don't need to be blown up out of proportion or something that's really important that's not really flashy, they won't give much attention to. I think the media has done, an, they've been, they've definitely been covering COVID-19 like nothing else. I've been on television basically every day since January of 2020. Um, so, so in that sense, they've been interested in an infectious disease the way they haven't been in anything else. But they do often, we, and this is, I mentioned earlier, I go on Fox, MSNBC, and CNN as much as I'm asked to go on any of those networks, and I'm not exclusive to the others, but they do, they, they do kind of funnel things through their own lens to their viewers, and I think that's bad. It happens on all of them, and I think that, that they don't necessarily become trusted sources of information. I tell people to watch the news between like noon or maybe between 10 a.m., and, and 5 p.m., that's when cable news is actually news. After that, it becomes entertainment on all three of those networks. So I don't know that you would get much valuable information. And, and because I'm not partisan, you very rarely see me that late on tele after 5 p.m. I'm usually a daytime person because that's when the news is out there. But I think they, they've got to get better at telling the story appropriately. They have to also get better at not amplifying misinformation, which they often do. They, they also have to really... Uh, allow doctors to not just be talking heads on there to be able to explain things with nuance and time. Oftentimes I'm trying to explain something in detail and the person is in my ear saying, wrap it up, wrap it up. And you can't do that. Um, you have to have a, a, a lot better, uh, a lot better, um, a, a lot better approach when you're doing that. Science journalists, I think are very different. Um, if you, if you read the New York times science section and look at those science journalists, you're going to find a lot more nuance there. STAT, which is, I recommend STAT News. I don't know if you guys subscribe to that. It's owned by the Boston Globe. Uh, it's probably the best science website, science news organization in the world. Um, and, and I think they do a good job, but that's all reading. It's not, it's not TV and everybody gets things on TV or in talk radio. And that's, that's really hard. I think, you know, we, it's not just the media doing a bad job with COVID-19. They do a bad job with everything. Um, and I would encourage people not to read headlines, read the actual body of the story. The headline writers are, are really, really bad. Like if there's, if 99.9% .9 of people don't get a breakthrough, they, they, so they think about breakthrough infections or, or people who are vaccinated who die from COVID-19, very, very low number, but they will not print that 99.99% .99 do not have a severe disease. They will say 353 people die, they'll, they'll write it that way. Um, they, they do a lot of tricky things, but I think that's more a function of our own society than actually the media. It's what the people actually want. And then uh, here's a good question. What would you say to the people that say, nobody's gonna tell me what to do? What's your point there? Well, I would say, then don't come to our hospitals then. That if, if you're gonna do that, just stay in your cabin and do what you're gonna do. It's those people that say that, nobody's gonna tell me what to do, but, but I'm a doctor, everybody tells me what to do because I can't refuse care to you. You're gonna show up, the unvaccinated person is gonna get sick and they're gonna show up at the hospital and they're gonna take a bet. So that, that they, they still will, that's the thing I don't understand is if nobody's gonna tell you what to do, then don't expect the hospital to, you to tell the hospital what to do to take care of you because we, we end up with these clusters of unvaccinated people who then impinge on hospital capacity. And this happens a lot in rural hospitals. So a hospital that I work at, um, one of them that I work at is in the suburb of Pittsburgh, a rural suburb of Pittsburgh, about 45 minutes north of Pittsburgh. And, there, they're getting crushed with unvaccinated people who are crushing their own community hospital. So that's what I tell people is that, yes, nobody can tell you what to do, but then don't, first of all, don't go infect other people. You don't have a right to do that. Typhoid Mary does not, went on, end, ended up on an island for a reason because she was infecting other people. So don't, you, you don't have a right to do that. And then you come and demand care 
when you don't get vaccinated and you, you, you take away a bed for somebody that might've had a stroke or might've had a heart attack or needs to be transferred out of state to get care for something, that, that's the issue is that their action then becomes our mess to clean up because we have to take care of them at the hospital. And because of MTALA, because of all that stuff, you can't say uh, we're not gonna deal with an unvaccinated patient. And, and that's, that's the problem is that they don't actually see the cascading impact of their decision, then it doesn't just affect them. They're actually directly going to impinge upon hospital capacity in the community they live in. And then Clinton, I'm gonna ask you, Clinton Glick, I'm gonna ask you if you would please ask your question, because I'm afraid I won't ask it the way you want it to be here. Good morning. Um, I have a question that, can you hear me? Okay. The um, question I have is a lot of people don't want to get vaccinated and they think it's only the older adults, even even though it's becoming more uh, prevalent that their children getting um, the virus. Um, when they put it in the newspapers about people that are dying or on social media or on the news, they always talk about they had uh, previous health conditions. And that's the reason that they're kind of pointing the, are directing you towards, make, you know, make it known that you're understanding that they had previous conditions and that's kind of attaching it to that. Now, the thing is, is when you go to tell people to get vaccinated, they're looking at it like, oh, they had health conditions, that's why they passed away. And nobody wants to get vaccinated because they, in their back of their minds, it's set where someone is um, telling them it's a, a previous health condition or existing health condition. How do we get around that type of messaging So I think I understand your question. So while it is true that young, the, the elderly are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and that younger groups tend to have less severe disease unless they have other high risk conditions. I think what I would tell people is why would you want to get COVID? It's not something you would want. Even if you were to, even if you don't have risk factors for severe disease, why do you want to be isolated for 10 days? Why do you want to have to go through contact tracing? Why do you want to be sick at home, unable to work or, or feeling miserable when a simple vaccine can prevent all of that? And the other thing is, as you might, it's not always 100% that it's all people with, with underlying conditions. There are going to be some people who get hospitalized who don't have underlying conditions. And then I also tell people that if you look, you know, the majority of Americans have an underlying condition because the majority of Americans are overweight. Uh, the, the, the rates of obesity and overweight are, are very high. So often those people say, I had a patient and he told me, I didn't think I had any high risk factors. Like I said to him out loud, I said, what is your height? What is your weight? And I calculated his BMI and I said, there's your high risk condition. Uh, people need to be really un understanding. It doesn't just mean asthma or diabetes or, or, or emphysema or whatever it might be. Obesity and overweight are conditions. And I think if the United States was a less obese and less overweight nation, we would have done a lot better because it ripped through those populations. So I, I and I think if you look at the demographics of who's getting infected now, it's, it's younger people and it's younger people that the majority of whom are obese or, or overweight that are getting infected and getting hospitalized. So I, I really just try to show people that they do have risk factors. And then the bottom line is, why do you want to get COVID? If you've got this great technology to stop you from getting it and to stop all the disruption that it, that it causes in your life, why don't you want to take it? You should want, I think of vaccines like iPhones. I always want the newest one because I think it's going to help me make my life better. Thank you. That answered my question. All right. Oh, we have one more question. Are you do okay on time, doctor? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good until three. Okay. Three is Eastern, so whatever that one, is. One o'clock our time, our mountain time, folks. All right. Um, when healthcare facilities uh, go into crisis standards of care, the unvaccinated should be the first to be triage off ventilators and place in hospice. I should have read this before I started saying it. Um, um, 
This, this is a, a highly opinionated comment. Um, so I'm gonna just leave it in the chat at that. Um, if you would like to make a comment on John's uh, chat. Let me just see, kind of see if I can find the chat. I don't know if I can see the chat. Okay. Right, I, can. I, I, I don't want to offend anyone, John. So um, let's uh, maybe. Yeah, I'm not, sure. I'm not sure I'm seeing the chat, so I can't comment on it. I can just say that just from the gist of what you said, that there are discussions going on uh, about crisis standards of care, when you have to ration care and figuring out what the criteria could be. It's very controversial, very charged. And, and there are people who are, are thinking about what criteria to, to put into place. And I know there is a discussion about vaccination status for, for adults uh, that's being debated. I don't know that it'll actually become implemented, but that's an ongoing, an ongoing process at the National Academies that, 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 that they're putting together for crisis standards. Thank you. Um, is there any other um, questions or comments that I may have missed? Let me see here. Thank you, John. Um, there was one, uh, there was a comment about starting to see valley fever um, that causes symptoms similar to COVID. A lot of them have the same symptoms, don't they? Yeah, so, so valley fever is a fungal disease called coccidiomycosis, and uh, it's usually in the southwestern part of the United States, and it's a very common cause of pneumonia there. And yes, it could be indistinguishable in the early stages from COVID-19, which is the importance of diagnostic testing, which I talked about earlier, that you want to be able to distinguish uh, infections from each other. And, and it's not something that you would be able to easily distinguish a COVID from coccidiomycosis or for, for valley fever, or you can't distinguish in influenza from COVID-19 for that matter. So I think diagnostic testing is important. Uh, these other infections are still out there. And I think it's important that we don't miss everything. Not everything is COVID, but a lot of things are COVID. All right. That looks like, I think we covered all the questions in the chat. Does anyone we have time for maybe one more if anybody wants to unmute. A lot of thank yous, a lot of appreciation for the presentation, um, Dr. Adelja. So uh, if there's no other questions, we can probably let you go. But thank you so much. This was wonderful information, really helpful to hear um, you know, your, your insights and your perspective. So thank you so much. And uh, folks, um, please take a, a minute um, if you have time. It took me three minutes to do the survey. So if you have time, please do the survey. Um, give us your honest opinions and evaluation. And uh, as I said, I will be posting this on our YouTube channel, the Intermountain Center for Disaster Preparedness uh, in YouTube. And um, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll all, you know, be able to get together again in person at some point. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you Dr. Adelja. Thank you. And hopefully I get to, I'll come to see you in person sometime. And please, we would absolutely love that. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Everybody stay safe. Take care all. Thank you.